Hello and welcome to this online presentation in which we will discuss the critical appraisal of RCTs and cohort studies uh, relating to questions around harm. So over the next few slides we'll uh, discuss a, um, a template um, that we'll use in critically appraising studies of uh, harm, be it RCTs or, or cohort studies. So most commonly this will be applied to cohort studies, um, which, which look at um, answering questions around harm. Although there may be the odd RCT that can also be used, um, particularly if the, the question of, of harm relates to a secondary outcome um, within an RCT. So the first question to ask um, when critically appraising studies of harm, uh, be it RCTs or cohort studies, is to identify were there clearly defined groups of patients similar in all ways apart from the exposure of interest. So again, this is looking at um, the baseline characteristics and basically saying apart from the fact that one group were exposed to a particular risk factor and another group were not exposed, were they similar in all other aspects? Um, be it age, sex, comorbidities, comorbidities etc. Um, and if they were not, um, were or was there some sort of statistical adjustment performed? So was some sort of adjustment performed um, if there were more males and females um, in the exposed group? Or if there were more 18 to 25 year olds than, um, than, than not um, in the exposed group as opposed to the control group? So the second question um, relates to uh, or asks, were the circumstances and methods of detecting the outcome similar for the exposed and control groups? And once again, this is relating to uh, detection bias. So the methods in, in which we um, identified the, the outcomes, um, were they blinded? So were the investigators blinded? Um, and, and how were they identified? Were they patient reported? Um, were they um, clinician reported? Um, quite often, if, the, if they were patient reported, um, we will have to um, identify was there any um, what we call response bias um, associated with that. So by response bias we're, we're um, identifying um, uh, a trend for the patients to manipulate the results in, in, in some way um, according to um, their exposure status. So let's say if, if, if someone has been um, drinking for the past 20 years and we're trying to identify what effect does alcohol have upon um, uh, the, the, the chances of developing liver cancer um, based on, on you know, what the patient might believe uh, they may um, f um, fudge their results and say you know they only drank once once you know once in a while or once once a week or once every two weeks um, to sort of appease themselves um, when in fact they may have been drinking on a more regular basis. Uh, so the third question um, asks, was the follow-up uh, sufficiently complete? Um, so again, were there any dropouts and if, and if so, were they accounted for? So once again, we're looking at this from a, uh, an attrition by From that, um, we will be asking, what are the results? So once again, what is the relative risk or risk ratio? How large um, was the treatment effect? And how precise was the um, estimate of the act? So once again, we'll, we'll run through uh, relative risk. So um, with studies around harm, be it RCTs or cohort studies, um, usually um, outcomes are reported according to relative risk. So in this case, um, we've got a hypothetical case in which we're looking at uh, mortality. Um, let's say it's mortality from cancer. Um, and some of our participants have been exposed to lycopene and others have been exposed to um, other vitamins let's say a multivitamin. So if we were to calculate our relative risk, um, we would um, calculate it um, with our exposed divided by our control or comparison group. So in this case, we get a relative risk of 2.85. So as previously mentioned, if we have a relative risk of one, it indicates no difference between the uh, exposed um, or the con uh, comparison groups. If we have a uh, relative risk less than one, it would indicate that the intervention group or the exposure group is beneficial. However, in this case, if we have a relative risk above one, it would indicate the exposed patients or the um, patients in the intervention group uh, were actually harmed in some way. That is, the control or the uh, comparison group is uh, more beneficial. So one way we could say, um, 
or, or interpret this uh, relative risk of 2.85 um, is to state that um, for those patients taking lycopene, uh, their risk of dying from cancer doubles, almost you know, triples. Another way to calculate this or, or interpret it is to look at relative risk reduction. So once again, it's just one minus the relative risk. However, in this case, if we calculate it, we get a relative risk reduction of minus 1.85. So we, because we've got this minus in this case, um, a negative and a negative in terms of the relative risk reduction, turn this into a positive. So we're not only calculating a relative risk reduction, in this case we're calculating a relative risk increase. So taking uh, lycopene in our hypothetical scenario here increases the risk of dying from cancer by 185%. Likewise, our absolute risk reduction, because we've got a negative, that is, more people are dying in the um, exposed group than they are in the control group or comparison group, um, we now don't have an absolute risk reduction, but we now have an absolute risk increase of 0.65%. Of, of so when we go to calculate our number need to treat, again, we have our negative in front of that number. So no longer is it a number need to treat, now it is a number needed to harm. So for every 154 patients who are exposed to lycopene, at least one will die from cancer in this particular hypothetical scenario. So the main thing to, to keep in mind is when you're looking at studies uh, of, of harm, um, to note that um, it may not always be a beneficial outcome that we um, identify, it may be a harmful effect, in which case relative risk increase, absolute risk increase and number need to harm. Uh, so again here we have a, uh, a graphical representation, so in this case um, uh, a, li a line of no effect is uh, 1, um, anything less than 1 is beneficial, anything above 1 is harmful. Because we have a relative risk of 2.85, it's all the way out here, it's above 1, which would indicate that the exposure is harmful, and our confidence intervals of 1.69 to 3.59, because they don't cross this line of no effect, um, would also indicate that this is a statistically significant difference as well. So the third uh, lot of questions relate to uh, tests of, of diagnostic causation. So one of the things we're really interested in when critically appraising studies of harm is was there any cause and effect relationship between the um, exposure and, and outcome? And these are three simple questions that you can ask uh, to identify whether or not this relationship does exist. If it does exist, again, it's a strong predictor um, of cause and effect between um, exposure and outcome. So the first question um, simply is, is it clear that exposure preceded the onset of outcome? Um, that is that the patients did not have the outcome prior to exposure. So something like, you know, does smoking cause lung cancer? Obviously, um, they w the patients will have need to have uh, smoked um, before um, the outcome of lung cancer can be um, identified. Is there a, uh, a dose response uh, gradient? So this is quite common in, in trials of, um, of, of drugs. So something like, let's say, we're looking at um, an NSAID um, and the primary outcome may be um, reduction of pain, um, but a, a secondary outcome may be um, uh, GI side effects. So if we look at different doses of, of the NSAIDs, uh, we may get a, um, a, a different response in terms of um, the severity of the side effects. And lastly, is there any positive evidence from a D-challenge, re-challenge study? So basically all a D-challenge, re-challenge study um, is identifying is if we um, uh, expose the patient to the risk factor, um, do they have the outcome? And likewise, if we uh, remove the risk factor, uh, does the outcome um, also go away? So, for example, with our NSAID um, example, um, a D-challenge, re-challenge study would be we expose the patients to NSAIDs. Um, if they uh, get a, um, a, an adverse event, that being, let's say, nausea, uh, we would remove them and then follow up and see again, do they have the nausea? 
Um, if they don't, um, then this is a, um, an example of de-challenge, re-challenge in which the risk factor, um, that being NSAIDs, um, can be closely linked with the outcome, that being normal. The last question, um, again, relates to generalizability, and that is how can I apply the results to patient care? So again, looking at the study uh, participants, how similar or dissimilar are they to my patient or patients um, of interest? So was the duration of follow-up adequate? And this, again, will only be applicable to RCTs and cohort studies because they are prospective in nature. So once again, what was the uh, duration of follow-up? Was it one week? Was it two weeks? Was it two months, two years? And is that appropriate for the outcomes and the exposures that we're interested in? What was the magnitude or seriousness of the risk? Um, and for this example, we would uh, be looking at the number need to treat or number need to harm. And the final question uh, aims to wrap up um, everything that we've, we've discussed. So um, it, it is asking, are there any benefits that uh, may potentially offset the risks of exposure or should we uh, uh, attempt to uh, stop the exposure in our patient? So the second um, uh, critical appraisal framework that we'll briefly run through is the GATE framework, um, which is associated with the uh, Rambo technique, uh, very aptly named. Uh, the GATE framework, uh, the GATE aspect relates to this um, structure here, um, and the Rambo uh, relates to the uh, critical appraisal aspect. So the first part um, relates to our, um, well, in fact, the whole uh, entire GATE framework and Rambo framework uh, revolve around the, uh, the PICO, so our patient intervention or exposure comparison and outcome. So the, the patient uh, aspect, um, in this example, we're looking at um, who were our patients. So the first um, aspect of the uh, inverted triangle relates to the source population. From that, who is eligible, so um, the, the study should have their eligibility, inclusion, exclusion criteria. And this also relates to who does the patient or who, who, who do the patients represent in our study. And secondly, um, of those patients that were eligible, how many actually were enrolled um, in the study? From that, we can identify how many patients were allocated to the exposure group or the control or comparison group, and were they accounted for? So in this case, we can identify that 311 out of the 1,934 were allocated to the, or were um, in the exposed group, as opposed to 1,623 out of the 1,900, 1,934 um, eligible patients. We can identify where, where they accounted for or the, the risk of attrition bias by breaking it down then into a two by two table. So from the two by two by, sorry, from the two by two table, we can identify that 10 out of the 311 patients in the exposed group had the outcome as opposed to 23 out of the 1623 uh, participants in the control group had the outcome. So again, whether we look at it, um, accounting uh, for withdrawals or, or, or dropouts at this level, um, we can also account for it at, at this level as well. The final um, aspect is uh, the measurement. Um, so um, what measures were in fact implemented and were they blinded in objective um, in any way? Um, and this is where we would uh, go back to our exposure and comparison group and um, just quickly identify uh, what the measures were and how they were measured um, from, from a blinding and objective perspective. Finally, from this, uh, we can calculate our relative risk. So 10 out of the uh, 311 um, the exposed group um, divided by um, 23 out of the uh, 1623 in the comparison group and we can get our relative risk of 2.26. Lastly, you can incorporate a time perspective. Um, it's not necessarily, but if you wanted to, you can incorporate time.